No need to raise your hand, but anyone here have a difficult person in their life? Okay, don't look at them. Keep your eyes up here. Straight ahead. Don't look. Okay. Moms, dads, uh, maybe for you it's that teenage child who's way smarter than you, Avi. Or, or maybe for you it's, it's the foolish friend that you have who just time and time again, what are you doing making that decision? And they keep repeating these. And it doesn't matter what advice you give them, they continue to make the same mistake. Or students, maybe for you the difficult person is the reason why you dread nine days from now. Yes, yeah, that S word that we don't speak, school. Yeah, there's a person at your school who's just made it their goal to make school as miserable as possible for you. How do we deal with difficult people in our lives? The bullies, the stubborn, the, the set in their ways, the simple who, who simply refuse to learn wisdom. How do we deal with these people in our lives? Well, if, if you have been tracking with our summer series, you probably already know that, that the book of Proverbs talks about these people and it gives them a name. Fool. And Proverbs chapter 26 teaches us all about how to deal with a fool. You can open your Bible to Proverbs chapter 26. That's where we're going to camp out today. And if you don't own a Bible, we would love you to have the Bible right in front of you in that pew rack. You can, you can just take it with you because we want you to realize that when you read the Bible, you learn about God. You learn his character. You learn who he is. And that's how he actually introduces you to relationship with him through Jesus. So, so take that Bible and this morning just open it to page 940. You'll be right there with us in Proverbs chapter 26. We have spent the last 10 weeks going through the book of Proverbs. We have been learning about about true wisdom. And what we've said is that true wisdom starts with trusting God. True wisdom starts with trusting God. And then it it takes this trust in God, God's wisdom, and it applies it to to everyday life, to, to the situations and the decisions that we have to make day after day. But a fool for one reason or another, just refuses to apply God's wisdom to their life. Uh, Tim Keller, who, who I've been learning all sorts of things from the book of Proverbs, Tim Keller, he describes a fool as someone who is out of touch with reality. They just, they just don't get how the real world works. They don't get how God's world works. And, and some people are, are fools because they're simple. They just, they just don't know any better. But, but some people are stubborn. They're set in their ways. You could call it obstinate. And then still other people are downright mean. They're just mean fools. And, and hey, you're, you're here on one of the last Sundays of summer, or, or you're watching this later online. You could be at the beach. You could be camping, but you're here. You, I know you, don't want to be a fool. But, but you know as well as I do, you can't control the people around us. Some people would just rather live in ignorance. Fools are a daily reality in our lives. We can't avoid it. So what do we do about them? How do we deal with difficult people? How do we coexist with fools? How do we we live with someone who just seems to live in a different world than we do, with a different set of rules and a different reality, and, and the universe just works a different way for them? Well, follow along as I read Proverbs chapter 26. Verse 1 through 12, and let's see what what Proverbs 26 has to say about how to deal with a fool. Verse 1, like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the backs of fools. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he'll be wise in his own eyes. Sending a message by the hands of a fool is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. Like the useless legs of one who is lame is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds at random is one who hires a fool or a passerby. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? 
there's more hope for a fool than for them. Uh, we, this week, Aaron and I will become parents to a five-year-old girl. I was just talking to Pete and Carrie as they were on their way. They said, hold on there, Andrew. She's going to grow up fast. Uh, this week, they are celebrating their daughter, their baby girl, getting married. It happens, apparently. You just blink your eyes. I keep telling Peyton, don't wake, don't get older. Please, just freeze right there. But yeah, we're, we're parents of a five-year-old girl, which by association makes us a Frozen family. And if you've heard anything about Frozen, which you kind of have to hear about Frozen in the world we live in, uh, there's Olaf, the snowman. He's this simple, lovely snowman, but he's, but he's a little bit foolish. Well, at one point, Olaf sings this song about summer, how nice it would be if he could be in summer. And, and he talks about, I'll get to do whatever snow does in summer. Winter is a great time to stay in and cuddle, but put me in summer and I'll be a happy snowman. <laughs> oh, Olaf, if only the world worked that way. And that's the equivalent of what it's like to deal with a foolish person. See verse 1? Like snow in summer or rain in the harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. We live in an age of idolization, of celebrity elevation. Uh, You can become famous for just being an influencer. In other words, you can just live your life and exist, and then you put it on Instagram or TikTok, and you can become a celebrity. This is the world we live in. But hear me on this, and young people, I'm talking to you. I see you dodging me. When your influence outpaces your maturity, you're in danger. When when your popularity grows faster than your character, you got to stop. Because now we're in a dangerous situation. Now, now we are in danger of falling. Again, putting ourselves up on a pedestal. We've talked about that. And when you fall with all that influence, you'll take other people with you. Uh, it's, if you'd like an illustration of this, just every leadership scandal you've ever heard of in the church, in politics, in organizations, it, it, it happens the same way. The, the leader grows in popularity and status. They get elevated. They get honored, to use the language of Proverbs but they weren't ready for it. Their character wasn't ready for it. We, we as humans can't handle being worshipped, even though that's what we desire, and so we fall. All of us are susceptible. So, so how do we deal with a, a fool in our life? For starters, don't give them more attention than they deserve. Do not give a fool more attention than necessary. That's what verse 1 talks about. The flattery, celebrity, don't indulge foolishness, don't honor it. But verse 2 says, says, don't fixate on their harsh words like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow. An undeserved curse does not come to rest. Translation, you don't fear for your safety when, when a small bird flutters toward you. Um, I know we have some nature lovers. Some of you take, take majestic photos of nature. Um, I'm sure you have never been out there watching and then like you see a, a sparrow kind of flutter towards you and you're like, run for your life! No, you see and you're like, oh, that's a, that's a beautiful bird. How cute. And you smile. Well, in the same way, when, when a fool slurs at you, when they try to slander you, don't, don't get bent out of shape when they fling an insult at you. Consider the sender. Smile. And don't take it personally. Uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2 also dispels for us the notion of bad luck or, or superstition. Um, God is in control of blessings and curses. So we don't need to stress about catching bad vibes or when someone sends their negative energy your way or however you would describe it. You don't have to worry about it. God's in control. He, he does the blessing and the cursing. Don't worry what other people say. Who cares? What a foolish person thinks of you. I know, I know, that's not, that's, I can, it's easy to say, Andrew, but, but truly, think about it. What, what does your heavenly Father think of you? Well, Jesus tells us. He thinks that we are, we're infinitely more valuable than a sparrow. He thinks that we're more gorgeous than, than all the lilies on the earth. That's the feedback that matters. That's what we should be listening to, and I get it. Criticism stings. I don't like it either when people criticize me, but, but when it comes from a fool, let it roll off. 
Consider the source, and, and you should, a, wis- a wise thing to do would be to ask God, is there, is there a grain of salt that I should pull out of that? And then let it go. So verse one, don't flatter a fool. Verse two, don't fixate on what they say. And then verse three, sometimes fools insist on learning the hard way. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the backs of fools. We're talking about discipline here. We're talking about learning the hard way. Verse four, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Verse five, answer a fool according to his folly, or he'll be wise in his own eyes. Huh? (laughs) What's going on there? Isn't that self-contradictory? This is, this is what drives some people crazy about the Bible. Can't you just, why do you keep confusing yourself? Well, what the proverb is trying to say here is that God's wisdom isn't one size fits all. Each situation, each person is unique, and we have to deal with it differently. You can't just press and play and be on your way. No, you, you, you have to think about it. You have to truly reflect on it. And, and, and what Proverbs is saying, especially in verse 4, is that sometimes... Sometimes you got to let a fool learn the hard way. Sometimes you just, you just back up, let him be, okay, as you were, <laughs> and let him learn the hard way, verse 4 is saying. And parents with, with more experience uh, than me, they'll tell you this. Sometimes the best medicine on occasion is a little tough love. They can handle it. Some, okay, you refuse to listen to me. You're going to learn this one the hard way. And I, I've told you this before, but I just want to encar- encourage parents who are ahead of me and who are in that stage. Um, my parents raised four children who were, who were s- unbelievably strong-willed and, and foolish at times, I'll say. Sorry to the other kids in my family for lumping you in. And all of us had at least a season where we, we lived anything but what God wanted for our lives. And still, by God's grace, each one of us, he pulled us back. And he taught us his wisdom. And by grace, we're living for him today. And so hopefully that's an encouragement for you parents. But the danger, the danger comes when we try to convince a fool who is set in their ways. Because we risk becoming a fool ourselves. We start to become unreasonable. We're yelling. We're, we're losing it on people. Or, or you're, you're so concentrated on just trying to get them to, to see what they've done to wrong you. You're going to get through to them. Or, or even worse, we're going we're gonna to pay them back. I'm going to get even. I'm going to repay you for what you did to me. And we think somehow that's, that's going to make us better. Oh, we'll feel better. Well, Andy Stanley, he's got a great series called Mean People and What to Do About Them. And he talks about this idea of, of repaying. He says, that doesn't give you the upper hand. When you get even with someone, it just makes you even with someone you don't even like. Getting even makes you even with someone you don't even like. And, and so, so just be careful to not become a fool. Sometimes you got to say something. Sometimes you got to learn the hard way, but other times, other times you, you need to speak up. That's what verse 5 is talking about. At times, God does want to use you and me, us, to, to speak correction or to, to help somebody else because they're, they're on this dangerous path and he wants to stop them. And so you may be thinking to yourself, well, how do I know when to zip it and when to speak up? Well, I'd say, say for starters, probably a principle is talk less, smile more. I learned that from Aaron Burr, but talk less, smile more. All of us, we could probably... We could probably stand to speak up just a little less. <laughs> We're probably on the side of saying what we think more than we should. So that, just for starters, but when it is the time you've, you've thought about this, it's the time to say something. Remember, compassion and clarity, grace and truth. Packaging matters. We've said that before, right? Compassion and clarity. Don't, don't just try to tie, like drill them into the ground. No. Package it so that they'll actually hear it. And then speak, speak in their language. Unless you literally, it's a different language and you don't know that language, that would be difficult. But you know what I mean by that. Talk in a way that they're going to understand you. Be relatable to them. Try to find a connection that you both have, a, a commonality, and start there. But I would say the most important advice to, to live God's wisdom and to know when to talk and when not to talk, just you got to pray. Pray about it. Ask God to, to show you his wisdom in the situation. And, and uh, so think about uh, Apostle Paul. He, 
He tells the churches in the New Testament that he, he prayed without ceasing for them. I, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. He was a busy guy. Like, when I'm talking about pray, pray about the situation. I don't mean, okay, you're in a meeting, you, you feel like you need to confront a fool, so, all right, I'm going to stop the meeting. Can we just take a recess? I get down on my knees, I pray for a half an hour, I stop every. No, like, I'm sure Paul had a really good quiet time with God. I'm sure he spent time praying and, and, and reading what his equivalent of the Bible, but but I'm sure pray, Paul also learned how to pray on the go and, and how, to, how to just ask for wisdom as he went through daily life. And the point I'm trying to make is that we, we should develop an instinct for asking God first, God, what should I do in this situation? I'm, I'm, I'm in it right now. What should I do? And then we act. And, and then we speak or, or confront. Uh, as, a, as a pastor, I, I have people ask me for feedback often. And in some situations, I, I'm like, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> you, you go ahead over there. But in other situations, I, I feel a conviction, and I, I hope that's from the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think I'm supposed to say something here. I think I'm supposed to do something. And I've had times where I have uh, spoken up, and, and I managed to very quickly put my foot in my mouth. And other times where, where I didn't say anything, and it's like, oh, I, I missed an opportunity. I see it now. But, but what's amazing is that in spite of how I act, that God always is able to do whatever he wants with me or without me. And so just trust him. Trust his wisdom. Ask for his wisdom. And, and pray without ceasing. Pray constantly. So, so we've prepared ourselves. We've, we've prayed. We're, we're kind of ready to dive in. Well, Proverbs 26 has one more warning for us. Dealing with fools is costly careful. It it will cost you your time, your energy. It will cost you to deal with fools. Verse 6, sending a message by the hands of a fool is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. I had a mentor who used to say, if you have to carry the dog to fetch the stick, you probably don't need the dog. (laughs) Yep. You ever try to send a message through someone else? Um, uh, maybe you're just busy. Maybe, maybe you knew it was going to be a confrontation and you didn't really want to do it, so, so you sent someone else in your place. You, you did that great move called delegation if you're a boss, delegation. Some, but, but then you, you pass that message along and, and, and you find out later that it just, it just blows up and you immediately live to regret not just telling it yourself. This is the warning of Proverbs. There, there are, like, delegation, yes, you've you got to do it sometimes, especially in organizations, even in families. Some, you have to delegate. But, but when it's something that needs to come from you personally, when it, when it represents who you are as a person and it's either going to make you look good or bad, or it needs to come from you. We've got to learn that lesson. Uh, we've got to avoid the headache or to use the language of Proverbs. We, we don't want to take our own feet out. We don't want to poison ourselves. Then verse 7 and verse 9 go on to talk about the uselessness or the ineffectiveness of a proverb or of wisdom in the mouth of a fool. Uh, it, it's the fool who, who's Mrs. or Mr. always right. They, they've never learned anything in their life because there's nothing for them to learn. They already know everything. And the trouble with that fool is that you never, they never grasp true understanding. They never learn to apply it. Well, a couple more Proverbs here just to prove the costliness of dealing with fools. Verse 10 of Proverbs 26, like an archer who wounds at random is one who hires a fool or any passerby. Today we might call that a shot in the dark. You're taking a shot in the dark and when the gun smoke settles, it's not just you who gets hurt. If you're a boss, if you're a manager, you're employees, because everyone has to now carry the extra weight. It affects more than just you. Verse 11, we heard this one earlier, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Dog owners, beautiful to watch, isn't it? It's like, really, you, you ate that the first time, and it didn't agree with you, you're, oh, and you're doing it again, okay. This is, mm-hmm. And sometimes... Isn't that like watching a fool? Like, didn't, last week, didn't you try that? No, we're trying it again. They just they don't learn from their mistakes. And so this is, this is a summary of some of the advice that we need to hear as we deal with difficult people because difficult people are a reality in our life. And so don't give them more attention than necessary. You're allowed to just say, here's the capacity I have. That's as much as I can give. 
And sometimes you just got to let them learn the hard way. Sometimes you need to, to speak into the situation. But, but we need to remember, weigh the cost, because there is a cost to dealing with fools. But then more than any advice Proverbs chapter 26 has for, for dealing with a fool, I hope you'll hear verse 12. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. In your effort to, to help a fool or to deal with a fool, don't become wise in your own eyes. Don't become wise in your own eyes. Don't, don't be so consumed with trying to help someone or trying to change someone or trying to put someone in their place that you become a fool yourself. And, and I, know, I know this sounds absurd, but, but really the posture that we should have, the way we should think about it is we're all just, just one fool walking with another. And we're trying to help each other out. That's really what we should be thinking about it as. Um, Apostle Paul, I mentioned him earlier. He, in the New Testament, he picks up on this idea of being wise in our own eyes. And what he says is that a truly wise person, they, they realize who they are before God. You're in charge, I'm not in charge. You, you are wise, I'm not wise. They, they realize who they are before God, and they realize who they are before others. And so 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, they, they talk about this, this idea of foolishness in God's eyes, foolishness in the eyes of the world. And, and in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, here's what Paul says. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So the question that, that we all have to, to ask us ourselves do you want to be wise in God's eyes? Do you want to be a, a, a fool for God? Or do you want to be a fool to the people around you? Do, do I want to, to be considered a, a, a fool by, by those who, who watch my life and it's different and I, there's something weird about you? Do I want to be a fool to, to the people around me? Or, or do I want to be a fool before God one day for him to say, you lived, you lived like a fool. Look at all the wisdom I gave you, and you just, you didn't live. You didn't, you didn't respond to that. Which brings us back to where we started this series in Proverbs, to King Solomon. It says, the fear of the Lord, trusting the Lord, of putting our lives under him and saying, you're in charge, I'm not. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, a, a thousand years after King Solomon, Jesus walks the earth, and, and he turned the wisdom of his world upside down. He, he, he walked around, and he claimed things like, hey, there's somebody wiser than Solomon. Somebody greater than Solomon is here now, and he's talking about himself. And then he taught, and the kingdom of Jesus, he taught, it's, it's upside down to the way that we would think. And so he said things like, like, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the weak because they'll inherit the earth. They'll be comforted. They, they will have the kingdom of heaven. And then he went around teaching uh, things like humility is more important than prestige. And eventually he, he exchanges his crown as king of the universe king of creation for, for a cross. And it made no sense to the people around him. Paul later reflected on it, says people who look at that and don't believe in Jesus say that's foolishness. Why would you do that? Well, he did that because he knew that, that all of us from time to time are prone to foolishness. We all can be the fool. And he wanted us an, op an opportunity for wisdom. He wanted to teach us God's wisdom, how not to be a fool when it comes to you and God. And then he says, I've set for you an example 
that you should follow. And, and the people of Jesus' day, they thought he was foolish. They couldn't believe the things he would say, but Jesus, Jesus left them with these words, and, and, and he says these words to us too. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who, who builds their house on a rock. The, the rains came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, but it did not fall because it had as its foundation the rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice, they're like the foolish builder who built their house on sand and the storms came and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against their house and it had a great fall. And so I want to ask you again, which, which kind of fool do you want to be? A fool in God's eyes? A fool who doesn't build with the right foundation? Or a fool to the people around you? In just a moment here, our worship team is going to come back up. They're going to introduce us to a, a new song. And I want to encourage you. Take a moment to reflect on the words. Take some time to think. Uh, maybe think about what we've heard this, this morning. Uh, maybe for you... Uh, you have a journal or you have your phone and you just need to jot down your takeaway. This is, this is what I'm going to be thinking about this week. Here's what I'm going to be trying to do in light of what God has taught me. Or, or maybe for you, it's, it's a chance for you to talk to God. You'll just quietly right where you are. Um, take a moment to pray. Maybe for some of us, for the first time, or the first time in a long time, we'll talk to God. And, and it could be as simple as saying, God, I've been a fool. I need to turn back to you uh, heard one person describe repentance that way. Repentance is really just turning back to God. Well, repentance is like coming to our senses. God, I've been wrong this whole time. You are wise. I want to trust you again today. Maybe in these next few minutes, you might just need to talk to someone because of uh, what's been going on in your life, because of what you've been thinking about. Well, you can just go right out those doors at the back, and one of our leaders would be happy to talk with you or maybe pray with you. So I'm going to invite our team back up, and I'm going to pray with us, and then we'll take that time. Father, as we've been getting close to the end of the book of Proverbs, we've realized there's a, hard, a lot of hard truths in this book. Um, we... We really do have a tendency to, to live for ourselves or to, to, to trust our own knowledge, to trust our own wisdom. And, and so often, that means we're not seeking you. We're not trusting you. We're not asking you how we should live our lives. And, and so we say sorry. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you that you, your son, is the epitome of grace and truth, the perfect representation. Thank you that he he doesn't just get angry, that you don't just get angry when we fail. You've offered us a lifeline. You've offered us relationship. You've offered us mercy. And so, Lord, I pray that all of us would experience your mercy today, and that would stir us up. That would motivate us to change by the power of your Holy Spirit, by your work in our lives, so that we can live for you. We can live in gratitude, built on the foundation that is Christ, who is our life. And so I pray this in his precious name because he said we're allowed to pray in his name. Amen.